What's going on, y'all? The Winner Circle here, your host, June Archer, and my special guest today. You can see this young lady on television once a week at least. She is a new star of the show, Tyler Perry's Assisted Living. Please give it up for my guest, Courtney Nicole. Nicole Courtney, how you doing? I'm wonderful, June. Thank you for having me this morning. We're going to have Listen, a good time. We're going to have a wonderful time. We were just talking backstage about being gracious the moment that we wake up and, and and you chimed in and said that's one of the first things that you do when you wake up how important is it to be so gracious the moment that we wake up um gratitude has to be big right and we have to give it in abundance you know um so before my feet touch the ground before i grab a phone i'm saying thank you and um this wise man that i met on a beach in aruba he told me once he said um he said god wants two things he wants you to say thank you and thank you and he wants you to say i'm sorry when you're wrong and so those two things i was like have always just stood out to me so i definitely try to make sure i do that um and you know just to kind of lead us into the conversation like look at look at my boss look at tyler perry right now you know like oh my gosh my bangs um but uh you know they like look, they look nice the, thank you all throughout the pandemic he's been like you know he gave uh the groceries for the uh he bought the groceries for the yeah. elderly um he bought some gift cards so that the police department there in atlanta could hand them out to the community to try to work on their relationship um and then he's announced that he's a billionaire you know so he didn't get those billions by hoarding them and keeping right. the gifts. So we have to say or, or thank coveting. you. Or coveting. Right? A lot a lot of people want to covet stuff, Courtney. They they hey, if I don't if I don't gather it, if I don't keep it, somebody else is gonna get it. And what happens if I give it away? You you will be blessed exponentially because of it. And I think that we have to change that perspective because people always run to the well crabs in the barrel. You know, well, they're gonna bring you down as soon as you get something, you know. You know how we do it. The black tax is in effect. If you give it away, I promise you, come if back. you give it away from your heart, yes. it'll come back exponentially. Absolutely. Genuinely. Um, June, last year, I broke my ankle in mm. July. July uh, 16th, I broke my ankle. And January 15th, I was flying in six months later, still healing, to shoot my first series regular role right on a network show and all while i was sitting on the couch healing you know i was looking at my friends book and i was watching them on commercials and i genuinely from my heart was rooting for them you know when i go in the room and it's other like we're all there together it's another sister and i'm like honey well if one of us gets this part then we're winning right because right. for me it's for me this might be for you, but what's for me is for me, and what's for me was for me, and I'm I'm so happy. I'm so excited about our show. So, yeah, I'm, I'm super excited about this. I think the perspective is interesting because a lot of people who are middle age, a little more mature, and growing it, they kind of understand that this represents where they are in their life. Talk, tell us about your role as Leah on Assisted Living. Oh my gosh, I love Leah. Uh, the show just came on again last night. Um, but, you know, she's a supportive wife. Um, they have two teenage kids. So, you know, that means they've been in the game and their marriage for a while. Um, one thing that I love about this show is it's multi-generational. You know, like I grew up with my grandfather in my house. So I know what it's like to live with a grandparent, you know. So we have grandpa, we have us, we have the kids, you know, and just it's a family. Um, and so that's what we look like. Um, so it was, it's really um, rewarding to play a character like Leah, right? Um, because she's the mom, you know, I get to give those looks that the mama looks that we all talk about and laugh we about. All, we all know, we all know very well. Me? Okay. <laughs> well, what is it? Play with somebody else. Cause I'm not your friend. <laughs> You know, so it's rewarding to uh to play those roles and just show the love. Um, and you know, black family units, black love on black entertainment television with Tyler Perry. Like, I couldn't be happier right now. But I also think, you know, not just in talking about race, but where we are right now, we're talking about allies and friendship. And so I have some, you know, some of my friends who are Asian Americans, Hispanic, white Americans, and 
I'm encouraging them all to watch the show, right? We all have grandpas. We all have kids or a mama and dad. And so it's a relatable show. Um, so I, I'm encouraging them to watch it as well because that's what that looks like, right? We have to right. watch everybody, right? right? Being a mama isn't like just for a black person. It's like that's everybody. And, and I love how you put that. I think we got to have those conversations. We got to kind of dive into one another's culture. How was it? How is it? I should say working with Jay Anthony Brown. He's he is hilariously funny. He's been around. He has been one of those staples in our community, especially as a comedian. How was it working? Like, is it ever a dull moment with Jay Anthony Brown? No, child. No, not at all. Let me tell you, when when they uh, in the room when I booked this, they were like, "Do you know Jay Anthony Brown?" I'm like, "Child, I've been listening to Jay Anthony Brown for years since I can remember." You know, like. On the radio, he's always been a voice or see, like you said, he's a comedian, he's done television, you know, so all of those things. So, oh, and he's such a pleasure to work with. Like, you know, when we were rehearsing, anything you needed, he was there. I've called him like after the show started, like after the first show, I like, I'm the mama for real. So like, I'm calling everybody like, hey, how was it? Did you like it? You enjoy it? Oh my gosh, that was so funny. And so, you know, I called Jay Anthony, I'm like, He's not going to answer the phone. He answered. We talked, chopped it up. So he's a wonderful spirit. He's so giving uh, and, and thoughtful. Um, he even, as, as one of his gifts, he gave us uh, like three or four samples of his hot sauce line that he had. Oh, yeah. How was that? Man, it's a peach hot sauce or something. And when, the bottle is gone. I'm working on the oh. other ones now. But it's oh. so good. So Listen, good. Jay, Jay Anthony, if you're watching this, please, I need a bottle, at least two. One, one that I'm going to use and one I'm, I'm going to put away. Because, you know, once company gets to knowing that you got something new and good, you're going to have to use it. Yeah, and you're gonna be yeah, they're going to be asking for it. <laughs> I want to talk about the dynamic, uh, Courtney. We don't, we haven't got the opportunity, but thank you to Tyler Perry. He has been doing a lot with family dynamic and, and showing what black life looks like in a household from different perspectives. How important is it right now as we're beginning to have these conversations and people thinking, you know, we we are the predators, we are violent, we are, you know, you know, this Black Lives Matter thing, like you guys are just trying to trying to change the narrative. How important is it to show black families in the light that Tyler Perry has been doing? Representation matters. Right? And so we are televising our own experience. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate him for that. I appreciate him showing those things. You know, like um, like I said, I, I lived with my grandfather. My grandfather was hilarious. My grandfather said some crazy stuff, you know. So like, and so to see Jay Anthony in this role um, and to, you know, be here as a family unit, I think it's important. It's important for our, our kids to see and it's important for our friends to see this. You know, I tell all my white allies, I'm like, get you a black friend. If you don't have a black friend, get you a black friend, right? Because then you got to know what's going on. And we right. have to show images of ourselves um, that are beautiful with our crooked teeth, with our straight teeth, with our different different shades, um, different sizes. You know, I just got, you know, I was just talking to a, another young lady in an interview about, you know, size representation matters. Like, I'm not a little woman, you know, like I, more than skinny women have husbands and have good relationships. You know what I'm saying? So I'm married. My husband loves all of me. So, you know, so we need to see that on TV, too. Right. No, no, we, we most certainly do. And for you, Courtney, you're playing a role with Leah that allows us to see black love with with your spouse, love with your children, with your with, you know, with a grandpa in the mix. But not only that, Courtney, you do it in real life. Right. And I want to talk about how you and your husband, because I, I read I, I did my homework. I was just I, I was I was trying to be in the moment. Yeah. And you guys have been together, you can correct me if I'm wrong, seven years, married two, traveled across the country. Now, when you're traveling across the country, you even talking about COVID, I want you to make this COVID related because people have been with their spouses since March. And some people, they go get, they may get a divorce. They, they may walk away with a couple of lumps, right? They're looking, 
never knew that their spouse snored, didn't know that they had the, the, the vices that they had. You do this in real life and you talk about how it's not easy, but for you, what does black love look like? What does it feel like? It feels good. It feels like a hug and a cup of coffee on the Sunday morning on your back porch. You know what I'm saying? That's what it feels like to me. It feels like some good music. It feels like some Marvin Gaye, Luther Vandross. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. That's what it feels like to me. Um, and it's so important. Um, this is a second marriage for both my husband and I. And I come from a blended family when blended wasn't even the term for it, right? Like I grew up with two dads uh, and very lucky to have them both in my life. And so it, we have basically an interracial relationship. We have four parents and a child. And I have a son who's 12 years old. He's mixed. Um, and then you have both sets of parents here. And I just think that it's important to, again, we're talking about representation and um, it's real, right? You know, I mean, I'm not gonna, you know, take us back down memory lane too far, but you can think of slavery and our, our men were taken from us, right? Right. Our men right. and our right. sons. Were, were taken from us and women, black women had to be strong and still work and still nurse and still do all of those things. And then we got to a point where we were free and then our men were in the military and you sent them different places and you know, different things happen. You didn't have cell phones. You could call somebody and say, Hey, I got this baby over here. So I think sometimes right. there were children that didn't grow up with their father, but, there may have been some instances where they didn't know all of those things. So we've always been at effect, right? Our gotcha. love, our black love has always been at effect to whatever is going on around us. And I think right now in this moment, we can live purposefully, right? Mm -hmm. We can be in this relationship. Not that they, they couldn't then, but even more so now. And it's just important to, to share that narrative. Like, I met my husband later in life. And I just believed that God was going to send my person and I had to be patient and wait. And, you mm. know, I, 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 I questioned, I wondered, I wrote, I journaled, I prayed, you know, I did all of those things. And I'm thankful that I waited and listened when I was supposed to and let go when I was supposed to so that I can have what I'm supposed to have. Now you talk about COVID, honey. I was like, I tell all my girlfriends, I say, honey, all y'all single talk about y'all out here and you want a date and you can't date cause it's COVID. I said, but honey, try, try not being able to go outside. Okay. I'm, we, we both running around the house. One day I'm chasing him and the other day he's chasing me. <laughs> Why not? Why not? That's, Why that's not? love. That's Why love. Not? You Why say we're we gonna be married all our lives, right? Okay, we ain't got a rush. Oh, okay, but no, we ain't got nothing else to do. No, I'm just playing. So it's been very interesting, uh, and it, it's been good. You have a lot of conversations, and I would just encourage people to try to make the best of it. I talk a lot about um, the five love languages, right? I mm. think that's very important for us. Um, I think his name is Gary Chapman or something like that. But you know, like some people love. They, they like gifts. Some people it's about communication. Some people it's about your action. So what is that love language? And I think that's something my husband and I took really seriously. And I, you know, try to figure out what's his love language and mine. Because I can't give him my love language and expect him to receive right. it anyway. Right. And one thing, and I'll stop talking and let you talk. <laughs> but another thing that I saw after we took that test and we learned a little bit, an apology quiz came up. And I was like, man. And it was learning your apology language. And I said, why, why, why is this the first time I've heard of this? And so we took that test. It's online too. You can look it up and take it, right? But what is your apology language, right? Because like I'm somebody that needs to hear, I need to hear you say, Courtney, I hear you, right? Right. We may disagree, right? But my husband doesn't need to hear that, right? His love language, I mean, his apology language is to actually do the action and okay. just, you know, he doesn't have to, have, have, I don't have to apologize. He don't have, he don't have to hear right. all of it. Right? Keep, just keep it moving. Just we, like, we just can... do it. But I'm right. like, I need to hear you acknowledge it and I need to see you do it. But, you know, but it's important to learn that in a relationship. And I think that, you know, and, and not just in 
are these relationships, these intimate relationships with your children, right? With the government, with yeah. our police, yes. With our schools, our teachers, like everything, it is real, right? Because like mm -hmm. now we're talking about what's going on in the world and we're talking about a relationship with police, but we haven't been able to sit down and have a conversation with the police, right? right. So what does that look like? And I think that's very important. So, you know. It's important, it's, it's important Courtney, but I, I want to ask you this. When we talk about relationships, mm -hmm. especially when you're getting married, people say, oh, communication is key. Communication is key. And I, I agree that communication is a large part of it, but the other piece, and I think you were just you were going in this direction uh, with the language, is how do, how does that person communicate, and how do you understand it, right? Because you may understand it one way, and you want your, your husband to explain it one way, but he he does he's not communicative as, as you are, right? So you got to learn how to communicate without communicating too much for someone who doesn't communicate. And I think the same goes with our police. Like we need to understand what it means when they say no soliciting, right? What does that mean? Not, hey, you guys can't get on this block, but how do they speak to us? They need to understand that when you have five or six men of color on on the block or in front of a store and they're talking and, and they seem to be so charismatic, they right. may not be starting trouble. They may be talking about the Lakers game last night yeah. and how LeBron just dropped 20 points and, his, and, their and it's nothing to do with anything just saying, hey guys, Man, just take it around the corner. But yeah, you know, Kobe is still one of the great. Michael Jordan is the GOAT. Like having those conversations, understanding how to communicate. So I want to ask you, how important is it to understand how each other communicates? Oh, it's it's so important. Um, I think you just made a great point, and all I'm about to do is piggyback on that. So my auntie and I were having a conversation. I have relatives who are in the police department, and we were talking about a situation. I'm from Chicago. So it was like I think my uncle was with someone that he was may have been training or, you know, they were working or whatever. And and that that other person wasn't as familiar with our us. Right. Or learning us. Right? right. And so my uncle could communicate with this group of people, unlike how this other person may have. Right. And I think it was a learning learning lesson for the other officer that he was with. But I think that's very important. And that's what we're talking about. Like when we talk about Camden, New Jersey and what happened when they defunded or the police or reimagined public safety, what it looks like. Right. And a lot of what they talk about is they had to get back into the community and work on the relationship. So. And while I was teaching, we took this test, right? And it was based off of colors. You had you, you learned what your color was based on this quiz that you had to take. So I think it would be very interesting if police departments actually maybe even sent out a survey to their community and asked them, what does policing, what would good policing look like to you? How would you like mm -hmm. to be police? Right. And then go back and, and, and you also have to do this training with your officers, too, because it's like we need to understand their language as well. And so right. that's what we talk about needing them to get into the hood, you know, get, well, not even the hood, get into our, our neighborhood, wherever right. it is that we live. Right. And having that conversation, because if you live over there on the other side of town and how y'all talk over there at the gas station versus how you come over here, you might see some of us standing here talking right. at the gas station like what you're talking about right like learn us don't just come over here and expect us to do what you want us to do right that's like expecting like i can't expect for people to talk to me or treat me how i would treat people i do have to teach them how to talk oh. to me and how to treat me and i think that's what ha what's happening black americans are like hey i don't really like this i don't want to be micromanaged i don't need you riding around in my hood you know what i'm saying all the time and so these things need to happen. So I was actually one of the nonprofits that I was that I have a brainchild about. We all have a brainchild in this in this time is to actually go in and be part of that bias training with the police and ask them how much they really know their community. They have to get to know their community and be willing to listen. So I think now that's how about that? I, I, and I, I I love that piece. I think it's important, and if there's any way that we can support you, please let us know. Uh, accountability, though, Courtney, like we want 
we want the officers and law enforcement to be accountable. But how important is it for us as a community, as a culture, to share with each other how accountability works on our end as well? Because I, I feel like when we talk about defunding the police, people feel like we don't want them around. But we want them around, but we want to be policed a little differently. We want to be understood. But we also need to understand if you run a red light, if you drive through a stop sign, if you're walking in the middle of the street when there's a sidewalk, there's an accountability factor. How can we educate our young people in saying, you know, there's a respect level here and an accountability level that will, I can't say it'll stop black and brown people from getting killed. I can't say that, I can't guarantee that. But I know that if we had these conversations, we can kind of lessen the opportunity to see themselves in that position. Absolutely. Do you agree? I totally agree with what you're saying. Um, I'm gonna like accountability to me for the police side. I want to say we need to end qualified immunity. They have to be able to be held responsible for what they're doing, right? Because all they have to say is that I was in fear for my life and we're done with the conversation. And that's just not acceptable anymore. Um, and so accountability on our side, like like I said, I grew up in Chicago, so I understand very well. I come from, a, I, I live in a city that um, um, uh, I live in, a, I lived in a city, I grew up in a city where a lot of things happened, right? And so yeah. We have to start with our youth. I agree with that, right? Because I think there's an age group that we probably gonna miss. They already have their yeah. minds made up and we're not gonna be able to reach them, right? But we can start with our babies. And you're right, I mean, but what? so what does it look like for us to be accountable, right? So we can no longer sit in our homes and be like, I'm good, I'm gonna let them figure it out. I think that's exactly. what it means to me, exactly. right? Because we do have to. That old African proverb that it takes a village, it does. I live by it. Right? I and live by talking, it. We're talking about assisted living, right? Where we live, we, we're, we're moving in with grandpa, right? And now, that is the village. We don't, the village. Have, we don't have that a lot anymore. We're so, right. we're so busy trying to get out of our mom and dad's house. Or parents are trying to kick their kids out at 20. Why? Why you want to kick them out of, you know, 18 years old? You know what I'm saying? They're still very youthful. Now, I ain't saying when they're 35, unless something happened and they need to come back home. But, you know, it's like, why are we pushing them out into the world, into the streets, right? And so we have to be responsible for our youth. We have to start going back and volunteering. We need to be mentors and we need to be part of the accountability and teaching them like, hey, we got to follow the rules sometimes because you know what culture we're living in right now? We're living in uh, everybody gets an appreciation award. You remember everybody get a fourth place trophy. You get an exactly. eighth place trophy. And so they aren't being, they aren't saying, hey, you know what? I have to do my part in this teamwork, right, to get my reward. They're saying, oh, I can just be here and get a reward, right? right. Show up. Things. Participation. You get a participation. Yeah. No. And so we don't need you to just stand by. It's kind of like that viral video of mine that went by when I tried to stop those two ladies from spray painting. The, and the, and I was, the, that's what I was leading to, Courtney. Accountability. accountability. You know, because when I walked up and I see them, right, I saw them on one side and I, I just so happened to look to the other side and there were like groups of people that were watching this and saying nothing. You cannot right. allow this. We have to speak up. I had to tell her that it was not right. That's not what we want, right? Me and my friend circles are not like, oh, let's go get some spray cans and spray paint. That's not what we want when we're talking about getting justice for somebody who was murdered, right? So we have to teach people and we have to be willing to speak up. We have to be willing to have some uncomfortable conversations, you know, because right. they can be uncomfortable. But I, like I say, when you, anybody who's gone to counseling, when you leave those counseling sessions, honey, you like wondering, you crying or upset right. with your spouse. Uncomfortable. Like, this supposed to make us better, but I'm mad at you right now, right? But you keep doing the counseling, right? And then like six months later, you find that you all are having better communication. So you can't be scared of the hurt and the upset that may arise from certain conversations. You have to believe that what you're doing is right, right? And know that you just keep doing what you're supposed to be doing and the rewards will come. We got to let God do the work, right? Mm -hmm. So we have to. 
We yeah. have to. So yeah, we I have to be a part of that accountability. So keep each other accountable. I want to. I want to. If I can, if you allow me, I want you to. If you could, I don't know if you how much you had the opportunity to look back at that moment, watching that video. But in that moment, uh, you bet you, you began to cry. Was it was it frustration? Was it anger? Was it was it disappointment? Was was it all of it? But for the, for for the better part of it, what were you feeling in that moment as the tears? Because I, I don't even know if you felt the tears when they were coming, but the the, the anger it looked like the, the the intensity was there. Have you had the opportunity to look back and say, "Wow, I was really angry. I was really disappointed." What was it for you in that moment? Um. I was disappointed and I was hurt. Like I'm heartbroken right now, June. You know, like heartbroken. And I've always been a person to want people to just try to understand. And I was frustrated that they weren't listening at first, right? And they're just right. trying to defend their point. But if you're out here, then why are you here? It starts with the why. And so mm -hmm. it's like, why are you here? So I was frustrated. I was hurt. And I was disappointed in the people that were standing by. I was more disappointed in the people that were standing by watching than I were with them. Because they mm -hmm. actually believed their point of view. Right. 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 So I was hurt by their actions that... You know, I was wondering if they had friends or, like I said, that black friend. Are you talking to somebody black or are you just in your non-black groups saying this is what we're going to do for black lives? Mm. Right? Got so it. I was hurt by that and I was disappointed in the actions of others. Like, we're here speaking up and speaking out and you're standing there not speaking up and not speaking out. And um, it's heartbreaking. And I, like, that was fresh after watching that video, I know so many of us watched it and some of us didn't, but I was caught off guard when I woke up in morning, that morning. Like, I don't normally grab my phone first. That morning, I grabbed my phone for some reason and I'm watching the video and the whole time I'm like, something's gonna happen, right? Like, I was watching it for the other thing to happen. Mm. And it never happened. And it never happened. So I was heartbroken for George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery. And I don't even think I knew at the time about Breonna Taylor and so many others. Every year I was in college, I got a phone call about somebody who grew up in my neighborhood that was murdered or shot. Every year. And that's not something that should be normal. We right. are dealing with scores and centuries of post-traumatic stress disorder. Yeah, and, and we, so we've that's got to do that that day. And, and I thank you so much for sharing that. I want to turn to, uh, you went to A&M, went, went to school and became a teacher. Uh, can you, at this moment, for those who are in education and whether elementary school uh, middle school, high school, who are on the front lines educating our kids, whether it's remote, whether it's hybrid. Uh, you had a love for children's education. What can you say to those who may be watching or listening uh, as a word of encouragement as they are on these front lines trying to educate our kids and trying to give them a sense of some type of normalcy? I just want to thank them. I don't think teachers get enough thanks. You know, it's like that love language, right? So right. some of them like to hear, thank you. Some of us like to receive it. So if you have a teacher in your family, in your friend circle, or your child's kid, I mean, your child's teacher, like send them a little gift card or something. This is tough for them too. And I want to shout out the parents who are at home who are trying to work on Zoom themselves. <laughs> Watch yeah. their kids Zoom and actually get work done, right? Right. Dinner, right? Like, and just those parents and the kids, man, for just showing up. I know kindergartners that are trying to learn via Zoom right now. That has to be crazy. But a word of encouragement is this is such a small, minuscule amount of time 
in comparison to your lifespan. Okay. Mm, so if you plan it. on living to you 70, 80, 90 years old, this year of 2020 will be nothing but a memory. So if we can just do what we have to do for the moment, right? We will get through this. We shall overcome, you know? We will. And so that's what I would say. Yeah, and this too shall pass is what, what our ancestors would say because it's in the good book. Uh, successful television show right now. You've been on stage. Uh, Black love, you're activist. You're doing all these things. What motivates you, Courtney? Um. So one of the taglines that I like to use is just to always go higher, right? I like to see people smile and, um, you know, I have to live fully and shine so we can allow others to shine. And I think that's just always been what what I've I've been about. Um and so I that's just important to me. I just think we have so much of the other stuff. I just want to make yeah, sure we have a lot. You, right? Yeah, we we, we have so, so much to shoulder and yeah. and for you uh, you've been on this journey, uh, you've been on the highways and byways of life, on your trajectory to where you are right now. And, and I believe you got so much left in you. This is just, you know, uh, not even the peak. You've got so many, so many other things to accomplish. Uh, for those who are going through, exactly, you're at the summit right now, but the peak is, the peak is, is you're going in. Okay, uh, people are losing their homes, right? They, they're losing their homes, they're, they're losing their jobs. They're, the, the relationships aren't as strong as they thought they were because of COVID. Uh, they're trying to figure it out right now. Along your journey, what has been the best piece of advice that you could share with somebody right now who cannot find a way to get through the roadblocks, the closed doors, and the obstacles? Keep putting one foot in front of the other. Mm. My grandfather used to say, just keep living. You know what I'm saying? Just keep living. Um, and they are, I mean, just to share, I have in Chicago been shot at. They weren't necessarily trying to shoot me. They were just shooting, right? I have uh, selected my car while driving Uber to live my dreams. I have had a, a home foreclosed on. Um, after teaching and a marriage going through a divorce, right? I've lost cars. Um, but I never lost sight of the fact that I have to continue to put one foot in front of the other and be grateful for what I do have. Be grateful for the, the fact that I can see, touch, smell. Be grateful for all of those things. So we have to be grateful for those things. I get in the shower and I'm like, I'm grateful for this hot water. That Don't let that moment pass you, right? You right. like, oh, end it in the next room. Ooh, but the shower feel good, child. Okay. The shower feel real good, right? Come on, somebody. You know, I've been in an abusive relationship. Um, and I'm not a little girl. I've been held by my neck with my feet off the ground. Mm. You know mm. what I'm saying? And we, I, I knew that that wasn't the end for me. So I was right. like, I looked, in, I looked at myself in the mirror and I said, God, I know this isn't what you want. But continue to order my steps. And um, I just believe that in my heart, I have the faith of a mustard seed. And um, so we just keep living, baby. Do not let your situation define you. Outshine your situation. Outshine your situation. And I promise you, you will see the glory. You know what I'm saying? So um, those horrible days don't last forever, but they are part of your testimony. I am able to use some of that hurt to showcase my gifts and talents to reach people through film and television. So what is your passion? Is it social work? Is it mm. architecture? Is it building your neighborhood and your area up? Like I encourage everybody who right now is sitting at home, whatever your thing is, make a plan. 
act like somebody told you you got five million dollars right and then you could come up with the best plan for your city if it's a city manager what is the new city running like you know if it's about gentrification what is that for you if it's about counseling do you want counseling centers within five miles of schools you excuse me i mean whatever your thing is if it's about clothes and fashion and making somebody feel good whatever it is come up dream as big as you can mm. and every day just make a little step towards that even if it's okay I'm, today i'm gonna make the list of everything that's one thing done now you can go and check all those things off and it's beautiful to see those check marks oh it it, it makes you feel good it makes, you feel good. it makes you feel like you're doing something, like you, you're making a difference. Absolutely. And can I say one thing? So gratitude, I want people to celebrate. Sometimes mm. you don't celebrate. Like you said, I'm at the summit. I'm not at the peak, right? But I had to get here. I had to first go find these shoes to hike with, right? Then I had to, you know, make sure my outfit was together. I had to make sure I had the right cords. I had to make sure yeah. all that was together. I had to make sure I had the right team behind me. And then I didn't get to this summit today. Mm. You know what I'm saying? I didn't what? get here today. It didn't come without bruises on my feet or, or breaking a toe or, you know, those mm. types of things. So mm. we have to celebrate those moments because if you don't, you know, you I'm going to look down. I'm at the summit. I'm looking down like, girl, you did that. Girl, you, you did, did that. Did. And then I look up like, oh, boy, you still got some work. But, girl, you did that. Okay. <laughs> I can get five more steps in. Because I said, girl, or, or man, you did that. You know what I'm saying? So celebrate yourself, sis, bro. Celebrate you. That's what I want people to do. This show is called The Winner's Circle. So I want to ask you, with, with saying that, how important is it to have the right people around you? We talked about the village earlier, right? And, and I, I this, this adage I live by, if you hang with nine broke friends, you're bound to be the 10th one. How important is it for you to surround yourself with not just like-minded people, right? Because you don't want people with the same, you want people that have diverse thinking and, and but how important is it for you to be around people who are upwardly mobile, who, who want to see you do well, who are holding you accountable and want to be held accountable, that that is your winner circle. Like how important is that? And who's in your winner circle, Courtney? Uh, who's in my winner circle? My husband, uh, I have my mom, my auntie, and I call them my two sister cousins, right? That's my top five. And then I, I still have a, there's still another tier, right? Um, you know, like I have great friend circles that I have from high school, college, you know, I think that's important, right? Um, so when people say I don't have friends, I'd be like, why you don't have no friends, right? Like, what's up? You, well, let's get you hooked up with the council center, okay? Because you got something you got to work on, baby. But, uh, <laughs> but um, so I think that's important. A couple of things, right? There's it's been said many ways, but basically your network is your net worth, right? So I think that's what you're saying. And uh, I don't know if everyone is familiar with this young lady, Lisa Nichols. She talks mm. about money and finances. So she talked about how she would go to her rich friend's house and just touch stuff, touch stuff, touch stuff, right? Because you're grounding yourself. It's important. So go to the Tesla lot. You might not want to drive a car that day, but walk on that street. Touch something. Touch the sign. You go touch, touch drive a car. Touch it. You go to your rich friend's house or something in there. Touch it. It's energy, right? Believe that you can have those things, right? So, and then pray. In my prayer, I say this. He, he said, no weapon formed against you shall Shout. prosper. He Correct. said it wouldn't come, Jim. Nah, it's going to come. Right. It, it will come. So what I pray for is that my circle is tight. And mm. I pray for discernment, right? So that when those weapons that he didn't say wouldn't come, right, come, all I got to do is open the link, push that out, close it back. Right. right. Or right. open the link, this is a new person, we're going to link this thing up. It's like a puzzle. So we have to keep you know, I would say pray. I would say, you know, touch things and, and believe, get in a state of belief. And yes, expand, expand your circle. Um, you definitely have to do that, even if it's volunteering or, you know, something like that. Like I I worked for a while um, at Waco Theater Center with uh, Miss Tina Knowles and Richard Lawson. So I want to have my own nonprofit organization. What better opportunity than to 
work with someone who is fundraising at this level or who is starting their own uh, organization, you know, to, to learn and absorb and be a sponge and absorb from. So put yourself in the right positions. Stop playing checkers, play chess. Right, right. And, and definitely stop playing Connect Four. How was it working with Tyler Perry on Tyler Perry Studios lot? Like I, I was in Georgia right before the pandemic and I saw the exit and I said, what? This bro got a whole exit sign for his compound. I haven't been there yet. And like you said, I, I got to go there and I'm going to have to touch it. I got, I'm, 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 I'm looking forward to Make it short. Sure. I oh, like you. Listen. I like you, oh, baby. I'm go, I'm gonna go and touch it because I'm listen. They need another Arsenio Hall. They need another Donnie oh, Simpson. They need God. another John Cornelius. They I need Joe Archer. Okay, okay. You, you, you hear what I'm saying? You, you hear yeah. what I'm saying? I do. How was it like walking on that lot where you had black names on the on the walls and in the in the rooms that you were performing? And how did that feel? The only word <laughs> that I've been able to use is amazing. Like, I don't even, I'm trying to think of a bigger word, but amazing. Um, and such a, a humbling, uh, gracious, uh, you know, like, it, it, it's like just all of the experience was just all of those things. Um, you know, he talked about um, last year at when he received the uh, Humanitarian Award at the BET uh -huh. Award. He talked about the land that he bought. And these were people who were fighting to keep us enslaved. And now he owns that land. And so I feel him now. I feel my ancestors tugging at my heart, my spirit, and my soul. And that's what you feel when you walk on that on that lot, when you see those names on the building. Like we filmed Assisted Living on stage 12, which is the Denzel Washington stage. And it's just beautiful, right? And then you look across and you see like, uh, you know, Oprah or, you know, I mean, just, it, it's, it's like. Just like it's. You ride past the White House and he has a replica of the White House that is fully furnished like the White House. You know what I'm saying? It's like, oh, okay. You know, and I like on the uh, Meet the Cast, I, I said that I jokingly say uh, everybody must have a good attitude, must be on the application. And hmm. I feel like you are just empowered to work in, in your black excellence while you're there. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to make sure that I showed up every day in that same vein. Um, so it's a beautiful experience. Um, it's beautiful working with him, you know, and just how he leads. Um, he leads with love and laughter. So, you know, I never, I never, I, there was not one day that we were filming that I was like, oh, never. Right. You know never. what I'm saying? not too tired to come in here and create so that people can laugh and feel warmth and you know that love and um he just leads with that so it was a beautiful experience everybody there you know they worked together for years so you know you're like the newbie i'm like okay yeah. do my job but it was just so amazing um so amazing i can't um, thank him enough. Um, and it's just a beautiful experience and you know it's amazing how god works right i happen to be on a black entertainment television with Tyler Perry Studios during this movement in 2020 when everything is being made clear, right? Our vision is being corrected, right? We said 2020 was about clear vision and it is. It's about clearing some stuff up. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, beautiful. I, I, I love it. Before I let you go, having such an amazing time, we're gonna have to do this again. Uh, but before I let you go, Music is a soundtrack to our lives. What song best represents your journey up to this point? Or what artist has been an influence along your journey? So there are three songs or people that are coming up for me, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and hit you with India Ari. Uh, hmm. The video one, I am not, you know, like sometimes I shave my legs, sometimes I don't. Like I might not be what you consider as a video vixen, but I am, 
right? And I'm me, right? So I think that resonated with me being like, you know, a thicker girl always, always being like one of the biggest girls out of my friend circles, but still finding my place where I'm beautiful and owning and accepting that. So I appreciate India Ivory for making that song and speaking to so many of us. Um, another song that's coming to mind is Jill Scott. Mm. With my life like it's golden. You know, because that's what it's about. So even before all of this, right, I was trying to live my life like it's golden. Like like we were telling people earlier today, not out. don't live with what your circumstances are. Live beyond that. And so that, that song is always um, spoken to me. So we got to live that life. And um, the last song that I'm going to talk about is... Um, um, Luther Vandross danced with my father. I uh, I feel I feel it, sis. I feel it. I'm with you. I um, I moved here in 2015. I lost my dad in 2016, and then I lost my grandfather in 2017, and um. I prayed and I was like, you know, God, I'm not, I don't, I don't want this gift. I don't want this to put in my toolbox for acting. Um, but I'm grateful and I miss him. And um, that song just always speaks to me. So, you know, as actors, we have, um, you know, a causative routine or, you know, places that we have to get to. And as, emotional or you know as it makes me or as much as I miss him I feel like I get to talk to him and use him during this experience and mm. uh, you know I did a play last year called no place to be somebody and uh, we ran for like a month and a half and uh, every night I was able to listen to that song and miss him but I was also able to say thank you because I had to love him that much right for me to miss him as much as i do so i know i got an angel up there i know he was up there worrying god honey like what well, oh god and she next you know what I'm <laughs> so, so i like to look at it like that just to kind of turn it around a little bit you know because it does bring me joy also like he you know i can get into that moment with that song and thinking about my dad but because i love him so much i can just also it just also brings me out you know of it and i can smile on the other side of it so it is one of those unfortunate gifts you know i mean it's life we know we we don't get to keep people forever we just right. wish we had them a little longer sometimes so um I would say those three things. And I, that was one of my dad's favorite artists. I remember he, he was crying when, when we lost with the Van Draw funny. My daddy was upset. Yeah, a lot, a, lot of us, a lot of us did. So the fact that that song and that artist is who I relate to him it just it speaks to me in a different way. So I appreciate you for being so transparent. You know you can't go nowhere now. Like, we, we are one now. I'm, I'm part of your village. You're part of mine. So we're okay, gonna, we're gonna love on you, girl. girl we're gonna love on you, and we listen. We're gonna keep praying for you because this summit is just what it is. The peak is coming, and it's gonna be plenty of them, plenty of them. So listen, wherever you are, if you're watching and listening, I need you to pray over this young lady and just keep wishing her success. And I'm telling you, she told y'all, touch on some stuff, go and put one foot in front of the other, and keep on living. Celebrate when you have the opportunity to celebrate because guess what? Tomorrow's gone. Today is here, but the moment that we just had is now gone. We only have tomorrow, and tomorrow's not promised. So please check her out. She's on Assisted Living, Tyler Perry's Assisted Living on TV. You can check out on Wednesdays. Nice. Playing, Leah, playing Leah, doing her thing, getting her black girl magic on. Courtney, thank you so much for joining the show. I appreciate you. We love you. This is your guy, June Archer, here on the Winter Circle. Thank y'all for tuning in. I appreciate y'all. Thank you, June.